Remember when I said in the last video that Dan's gonna try to control his behavior? Well, this clip right here proves it. Because if you look right here, when he freezes, he looks directly at the camera through the corner of his eye. I wanna give you an opportunity to kind of elaborate on something. Okay. The thought process from the series is you had the power to just write a joke and no matter what, it's going on TV. You just had that type of power. Is that true? The, the notion that I had the power to just produce whatever I wanted and have it air is completely false. Okay. There were many, many levels of scrutiny, okay? We had executives in LA. We had executives in New York. So two coasts. Two coasts okay. of, of, of approval, coasts. yes. And, not, and by the way, approval at every stage, really. Okay. And I'm talking about wardrobe. I'm talking about makeup, sound, sets, dialogue, jokes, everything. Now, when you say approval, these obviously that's a hierarchy, not your no, colleagues right. or people in the room. Okay. No, no, not my colleagues. No, these are my bosses. Bosses, and then their bosses, and then their bosses. And they're approving all of this stuff. Okay. Okay? And we're also shooting it in front of all sorts of adults and caregivers and the set teacher and, and the families. Everybody's watching it. And if anybody had said anything, hey, we don't like that. That's not appropriate. You then, it would have been cut out. Now... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back a little bit sure. because the series mm -hmm. painted you in this way that you were just the guy that was doing what he wanted and mm -hmm. people were afraid to confront you about things. So say, just humor me, say that that was the case. What would have been the ultimate way to... Okay, if nobody on the set, if all of the dozens and dozens of adults that were on the set, if they didn't say anything, if my bosses said, if they insisted, you've got to make a change here, you got to cut that. I had to do it. I had no choice. Got it. When Dan first starts answering Boogie, he's calm and collected. From what I'm seeing, it feels like he's in control. When Boogie interrupted him, he tried to help Dan answer the question. I guess Dan didn't like that very much. That wasn't part of the plan or the script. We see Dan's speech speed up. When someone's cadence speeds up, that means they want to lessen the psychological stress that's being applied. They want to hurry up and get what they have to say out of the way so they won't be interrupted again and move on from the question. After that happened, we got an odd gesture from Dan. He goes across his arms, but then he stops. He's probably thinking that if he goes to do this, people are not going to believe him. They're going to think he's lying or he's closing himself off. And here we get a turtling gesture, an eyebrow flash, and some head tilt. Turtling gestures is when someone's shoulders go up and their head goes down. This is done out of fear. Their head would go in between their shoulders. I also want to add that when someone crosses their arms, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean barriers or stuff like that. The only time it actually means something is if there's other gestures presented at the time that the arm crossing happens. I think Dan has a fear in what he's about to say. He doesn't really believe what he's about to say. He's scared to say it. People aren't going to believe him. That's why we get the eyebrow flash and the head tilt to try and come off as innocent and gain your trust. Now this whole statement he gives Boogie, he's trying to pass off or share the blame with the bosses. That this is not all his fault. If they didn't say anything, if my bosses said, if they insisted, you've got to make a change here, you got to cut that. I had to do it. I had no choice. Got it. In layman's terms, the jokes, the scripts, the adult jokes, the sets, the way scenes were played out, the clothing, they were all approved by somebody else. So he felt that it was okay. And it's not just his fault. Now this next one, it kind of hit close to home. Mm -hmm. uh, being a new father, I wouldn't be opposed of, to my child being in the entertainment industry. It doesn't matter what age, yeah? Seeing some of those on-air dares, seeing it now from where you are now in your life, what do you think of that? I think that some of the on-air dares went too far. I think they pushed the envelope too far. Not all of them, not most of them, but some did. Nickelodeon wanted to do their version of Fear Factor. At the time we were shooting all that, so I was tasked with doing these on-air dares with the All That cast. So we get with the writers and we come up with all these ideas and it's hard to do because we don't have the budget of Fear Factor sure. and we can't put the kids in dangerous situations like the adults are put in. So kids. it was hard to, yeah, hard to come up with stuff. But we would come up with all these ideas of dares they could do. We would uh, uh, give them to the network and they would say, one, tell us the ones that were okay. Right. Those are the ones we shot. Those are the ones that aired. At the time, I had no indication that any kid ever had a problem with them. But when I was watching the show over the past two nights, I now know that there were kids who did have problems with the on-air dares. And it breaks my heart. And I'm so sorry. I am so sorry to any kid who ever had to do a dare or anything that they didn't want to do or weren't comfortable doing. We went out of our way to make sure they were safe and, and that everything was done properly. But if a kid was scared and didn't want to do it, kids shouldn't have had to do it. Yeah. Period. The end. Right. And if I had known at the time, I would, I would have changed it on the spot. 
When Boogie goes to talk about the on-air dares, Dan knows his question is coming. He's preparing himself, but his blink rate goes up a little bit. We get a vertical head shake, we get a fake leaf, and we get some digital flexion. We all know what a vertical head shake is. It means an agreement. But as he's agreeing, his hand is in a fake leaf, protecting himself. His fingers are drawn in. He's feeling some type of anxiety or discomfort. His blink rate picks up a little bit. And once Boogie says on air dares, we get an eye blocking to put a barrier between him and the question. Now his answer is the same as before. If anyone had a problem with it, then they should have said something, but everything was approved. So it's not his fault. He thought it was okay. They were just jokes. They also highlighted two black actors who said that they felt overlooked. Now I want to be clear. I'm never going to speak on anyone else's journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can talk about my experience, how my experience was with you, what I saw prior to working with you. But again, I don't want to speak on anyone's journey. I saw you be honored for diversity in your work. Yes. And the reason for that is diversity has always been very important to me in my shows. If you go back to the very first Nickelodeon show I ever made, that's very evident as it is in the second one, and then the first movie I ever made for Nickelodeon, which starred Keenan and Kel, and every show I did after that had a lead black actor in it. I'm very proud of that, it's very important to me. And not only am I proud that they were in my shows, I'm exceptionally proud of the achievements they've had beyond my shows, and they've gone on to bigger and better things, and that gives me a great sense of pride. And there's really nothing to say here because they really didn't address the actors and how they felt. Only thing that happened was Dan gave a resume statement on his achievements and his awards for diversity. I would say though, that as he's giving this resume statement, his hands are in a steeple, like he has a moral high ground. Well, something that really kind of bothered me was how they depicted your relationship with the cast. Yeah, it bothered me too. Yeah, just me being there, I knew the dynamic was trust. I understood that in situations where they may have had turmoil, whether it be with their families, whether it be other castmates, they came to you versus how they made you look. With that said. Now Dan's facial expressions here are odd. He has two facial expressions going on at once, disgust and anger for the way that the documentary made him look. Remember when I said in the last video that Dan's gonna try to control his behavior? Well, this clip right here proves it. We get another vertical head shake, a lip compression moving out of a fig leaf. He knows where this is going and he's prepared. But Dan freezes when this happens. He's probably got a feeling that he did something wrong. His blink rate starts to go up a bit. Because if you look right here, when he freezes, he looks directly at the camera through the corner of his eye. I thought that was really interesting. He is micromanaging himself. Amanda Bynes was brought up in the series mm -hmm. and her emancipation and how you were involved in that. Can you talk to us about it a bit? Sure. Um, Amanda was between the ages of 16 and 17 and she wanted to get emancipated from her parents, mm. which was a fairly common thing with successful young actors, at least at the time. Sure. Um, and she wanted that for herself. So she turned to her team, which included her lawyer, her agent, her manager, her publicist, me, because she included me as part of her team, thought of me that way. We supported her. She tried to get emancipated and it ended up not working out and she didn't. Well, since we're here, let's stay here for a moment. There was also an incident where she had ran away from home, if yes. you would. Um, can you talk to us a little bit just to clear the air of exactly what happened in that situation? Yes. Uh, one night, it was very late, well after midnight, one or two in the morning, phone rang, I answered, it was Amanda. She was upset, she was in distress, she had had some conflict with her parents, I think her father, and she called me. I was immediately concerned about her safety, I called someone who I knew was fairly nearby. That person was able to go and pick her up. Then I knew she was safe. I felt better. She ended up being taken to the police. Well, regardless of what some people may think, I think it's only positive that you are there for people when they need you. When Dan goes to talk about Amanda, it doesn't sound normal. There's no personality. There's no emotion. It sounds pre-rehearsed, like he's being told what to say. He's reading off of a script. Every response and answer before this point had a lot of emotion and had a lot of personality. This time it doesn't. You see this again when he goes to talk about the night that Amanda ran away. He goes as far as giving a time. Well after midnight, one or two in the morning. I bet if he was to repeat this again, both statements backwards, he wouldn't be able to do it because it's rehearsed a certain way. If it was natural, you'd be able to say it backwards. Might be jumbled up a little bit, but you'll be able to remember it and say it. The darkest part of this series discussed child. 
Now, I want to make sure that we clear a couple of things up. Okay. Brian Peck was not hired by you. No, I did not hire Brian Peck. This was a Tolan Robbins production? Yeah. And when Drake and I talked and he told me what had happened, I was more devastated by that than anything that ever happened to me in my career thus far. Mm. And I told him, I'm here for you. What do you need? Which Drake mentioned in the show that we watched last night. And next, I heard that he went to court when this guy was being tried, Peck. And when Drake walked in, he saw 50 people sitting on the side of the courtroom supporting Peck. A lot of them pretty famous. Of course, Drake was devastated that that happened. And, and even more disappointing, 41 of those people wrote letters for Peck, character letters, praising him for who he was and asking for leniency, and they knew that he was guilty. They knew he had confessed to some degree, mm -hmm. and they still did this. It's just, that's baffling that adults would do that. Yeah. And I don't know if people know this, but Drake's mom, a lovely woman who I stay in contact with this day, she came to me at the time and she said, Dan, I'm not good with words like you are. And would you help me with my speech for the judge? And I said, of course, and I did. And he ended up going to prison and serving his time. And yeah, that was probably the darkest part of my career. And here's the kicker that I really don't get. After he got out of prison and was, to my knowledge, a registered he was hired on a Disney Channel show. I, I, don't, I don't understand that. Um, I never, yeah, I don't understand. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that, man. Are you okay? You wanna take a minute? Yeah, I'm all right. Let's, let's keep going. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Here we get a non-contracting statement. I did not hire Brian Peck. When someone uses a non-contracting statement, they feel like this is the best way to communicate, the best way to be believed in what they're saying. Now, I wanted to double check and see who hired Brian Peck, but there's no public information on this, so I couldn't be sure. And Boogie goes as far as answering the rest of the question for Dan, where all Dan had to do was say yes and not give any more information about the hiring of Brian. This was a Tolan Robbins production? Yeah. The question should have been, did you hire Brian Peck? And if you didn't, who did? And did they do a thorough background check? Now, Dan goes in detail about what happened between Brian Peck and Drake Bell. Dan goes as far as giving a specific number of how many people were in the courtroom. And Dan wasn't even there. His entire side of the courtroom was full. And when Drake walked in, he saw 50 people sitting on the side of the courtroom. When Dan goes to talk about helping Drake's mom write the letter, this is a very emotional memory for him. You can see the tears and sadness on his face for a couple seconds. The tears look genuine, but the expression looks forced. There was some sadness and there was some grief only for a couple seconds. Now I want to add, I'm not going to discredit someone's feelings or emotions. You can see the grief muscle right here. Now in some people it's very visible and in others it's hard to see. It's hard to notice. What made it only last for a couple seconds is because he tried to force it. He tried to amplify that emotion. But when he stopped talking about the letter and changed topics a bit, that emotion fell off his face. It didn't fade away like it's supposed to normally. A true facial expression will fade away. A false facial expression will drop off your face. And then he goes talking more about it, making the whole thing about him. Yeah, that was probably the darkest part of my career. Like this is his worst time in his career. And as he progresses in that, he ended up getting a lip compression, like he's wanting to say something, but then he stopped himself, leading into a fading fax. He was hired on a Disney Channel show. I, I don't understand that. Um, I never, yeah, you know, I don't understand. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that, man. Are you okay? You wanna take a minute? Yeah, I'm all right. Let's, let's keep going. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, I think we really unpacked some important things. We set the record straight on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Before I let you get out of here, I appreciate the 
vulnerability that you use in knowing that there's definitely things that you would have and should have done differently. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we haven't discussed? Anything that if you could go back and navigate the, the journey differently, what would that look like? Um, yeah, there's definitely things that I would do differently. Um, one that I think would be really, really important is when you're hiring young actors, minors, to work in television, I would suggest that we have a licensed therapist there to oversee that process for the specific reason of making sure that those kids really wanted to do this job, that yeah. they really wanted to be on television. Yeah. Maybe they should even be informed about what that means. What's it gonna mean if you're famous? What's that gonna mean on social media? What's it gonna mean within your family? Right. Let them find out. And then that way, if a kid doesn't wanna be on a TV show, they can opt out. Yeah. That, that psychologist, that therapist could come to us and say, this kid is, is, doesn't wanna do it, or their parents aren't, aren't uh, understanding of what's gonna come. And then we could avoid the mistake of ever putting a kid in a TV show that didn't wanna be there. Um, and additionally, the main thing that I would change is how I treat people and everyone. I, I definitely at times didn't give people the best of me. I, I didn't show enough patience. I could be cocky and definitely over ambitious and sometimes just straight up rude and obnoxious and I am so sorry that I ever was. And um, all right. when I watched the show, I could see the hurt in some people's eyes and it made me feel awful and regretful and sorry. Um, I wish I could go back, you know, especially to those earlier years of my career and bring the growth and the experience that I have now and just do a better job and never ever feel like it was okay to be an asshole to anyone ever. Um, look, I, I wanted to make funny TV shows for kids, and we definitely did that. But if I could go back, I would get it done in different ways. I, I'd just be nicer as often as possible and listen more to the people on my team. And um, I would do everything that I could to make sure that everyone had a good experience. Uh, that's what I do differently. Dan, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you. Thanks for stopping by, man. Thank you. When asked about what he would do differently, he ends up giving suggestions. This response is like he's blaming the kid for the adult jokes, the offenders that get hired. Instead of making suggestions like, we need better background checks on adult employees, kids and adults should be left one-on-one -on -one with an adult unless it's family. Suggestions like that instead of making it sound like everything was the kid's fault. Pre-watch episodes before they're aired. Put more scrutiny on scripts. Get a checklist going on what can and cannot be put on kids' shows. I feel like he was blaming the kids that all this happened, like it was their fault. If we do stuff like this now, we wouldn't have the same scenario. Make sure the kid understands what it is to be an actor, and if they don't, they can't act. Going in more into what he would change, he has a very smug facial expression. We get a lip compression and some teeth sucking. He's holding back an opinion and showing some disrespect to the people that are viewing this interview. And in this whole response, he's just being smug and he's just saying this to cover his own self. He knows what he did and he got away with it. He got his money, so it doesn't really matter. I think throughout this whole interview or apology video that Boogie wasn't the right and proper person to do this interview. They should have got somebody, someone who was neutral and that could ask the right questions. Everything in this interview seemed to be rehearsed, scripted, and had probably had several takes, like a TV show. What are your thoughts on Dan's apology video or interview, whichever you want to call it? Do you think he was being genuine or just saying what people want to hear? I would love to hear your opinion. I hope you enjoyed this behavioral analyst type video. I enjoyed making it. I had fun making it. If you have any suggestions on videos you want me to do, let me know. Until then, I'll see you in the next video.